Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. And I, as I always say, if you see something, say something. Today, we're going to be talking about Victoria Martins. Victoria was only 10 years old when tragedy completely struck her in a brutal way. When I looked into this case, I actually had another case ahead of this one, but it, the trial just ended and I just cannot wait to get this out. This story has been covered before, so it's not original, but it did, um, the trial just ended. So there is some additional facts that hopefully I can add to it. So after, you know, six long years, like I said, it went to trial. It's time this young girl needs to have her story told completely. So let's talk about Victoria. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thanks to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. What a fun game to relax and get your noggin going. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game. The set is from the stunning 1920s. The aesthetic, the fashion, oh, there's nothing better. It's so beautiful. June's Journey is a free download from your app store or Facebook to wherever you prefer to play your games on, your computer, your tablet, or just your cell phone. The game is easy to play, but just a little explanation, you look for hidden objects to unlock clues to solve the murder mystery crime. With each round, it gets a bit more challenging. You can redeem some of your rewards and points on this side game to build out your estate, your dream estate. June's Journey is a great way to pass the time or if you are just, you know, soaking in the bathtub, you know, a few minutes of self-care, very important. You can download June's Journey today for free. Use my link down in the description box and you can solve your very own murder mystery. Thanks to June's Journey for making today's video possible and thanks to all you guys for listening. On August 1st, my birthday, I just had a birthday guys, 2022 Fabian Gonzalez was found guilty of child abuse resulting in Victoria Martin's death. Who was Victoria and how the heck did we get here? Victoria Ann Martins was born on August 23, 2006 in Albuquerque, New Mexico to her mom, Michelle Martins. Michelle was originally from the Bronx, New York, and had lived in Texas before she settled in New Mexico. Michelle actually gave birth to Victoria at home. She came while she was home alone after uh, she gave birth, they went to the hospital and they both were both cleared and both completely healthy. And Michelle called Victoria her miracle child because she hadn't even had any prenatal care, no care whatsoever. Victoria had a younger brother named Matthew who was eight years old when she was killed. And for all intensive purposes, she was a cherished student at Petroglyph Elementary School. She loved the color purple, swimming, gymnastics, and played with her friends. John and Pat Martins, Victoria's grandparents, said she was a sweet girl who smiled all the time. For seven years, Michelle and Matthew's dad dated, and the kids had a very stable life up to this point. However, in 2015, the parents were able, they weren't able to make it work. And so the relationship ended and they split up. This is, seems to be the turning point for Michelle and the kids. At this point, Michelle started dating David Hernandez in March of 2016. Michelle actually called Children, Youth, and Families Department, C-Y-F-D, but I'm just going to call it uh, Child Services. Michelle called on herself to report that her boyfriend was acting inappropriately with her nine-year-old daughter coming on to her and also tried to kiss her. 
Before we go forward, just so we have all the information, David had a pretty serious criminal background. He had a history of essaying children in his own family, and he had been arrested for trying to kidnap a four-year-old back in 2013. He was seen doing this and the little girl was recovered and unharmed, but they didn't have enough evidence to charge him. It's highly unlikely Michelle knew about his criminal past. As soon as she learned he was inappropriate with Victoria, she called child services and kicked him the hell out. This incident though, would spark a huge issue for the city of Albuquerque and the police department. You see, Michelle kept calling child services. She called them, in fact, five times. She was trying to make sure that David, even though he's not around Victoria anymore, she wanted to make sure that David is not able to hurt another child. So child services did take her seriously and they did their job. They sent the referral over to the Albuquerque Police Department, but they decided just not to investigate. In fact, after Victoria's death, they released a statement saying, unfortunately, somebody attempting to do something such as kiss a child is not a crime. And that was from former F. PD spokesperson Fred Duran. Also, after Victoria's murder, Fred Duran would cause a huge scandal when he lied to journalists, news stations, and the public stating that the APD had, in fact, investigated and handled the complaint. This statement said that they met with Michelle and Victoria, which was a blatant lie because nobody had met with them. And it makes me wonder, in Victoria's autopsy report, she did test positive for HPV. And if you're familiar with that, that's, you know, sexually transmitted so and uh, their findings were consistent with an essay considering she was living with a known predator it is possible this came from him according to michelle's parents and even the neighbors that testified michelle and her kids were living a solid and stable life after she kicked david out she got a job at the local deli department of a grocery store that they lived that she lived right close by her and the kids were thriving the kids were thriving in school but as it seems many times in michelle's life she seems to pick the wrong man every time. Girl, can I relate. I think we're all guilty of lapses of judgment, but in Michelle's case, it deeply affected her children. At the end of July of 2016, Michelle met a guy on Plenty of Fish. Does anything ever good come from Plenty of Fish? But his name was Fabian Gonzalez. Although immediately she asked him to move in with her, and her children. Michelle did smoke cigarettes, but she didn't do any other drugs, and she didn't really drink alcohol that much. She had just passed a drug test for the job that she had a month before. She said she didn't know Fabian was a pot smoker at first, but when she found out, she didn't really like it, but she said, just make sure you do it outside. She did not know he did any stronger drugs. One other thing you should know about Michelle is that she is different. I don't know if that's a a good term to use, but Michelle was later interviewed by a psychologist and diagnosed with a low IQ and highly suggestible. When they say highly suggestible, they truly mean it. It means that in general, you can get Michelle to agree to pretty much anything you want. We'll stick a pin in that one and we'll definitely come back to it. So Michelle said she thought Fabian was a good guy at first. He was good with the kids and he helped out around the house. He would cook dinner, he would clean up around the house, and she said she didn't even have to ask him. He would just do it. To listen to Michelle describe Fabian, you might think that they had, you know, a great relationship. But Michelle didn't see the real Fabian. When Michelle went to work at her night shift job, 
Fabian kept her car. The neighbors testified people were in and out of that apartment constantly when Michelle was gone. Fabian also lived off of Michelle because he didn't have a job. So he used Michelle's car. He used all her gas. He used her EBT or her food stamp card. Um, he also sold them, which apparently uh, Michelle had no idea he was even doing that. In his trial, they showed that he was still talking to other women online and living off of Michelle up until the very end. And Fabian also asked Michelle not to tell her parents about him yet. It wasn't the right time. Things were just too new. But I think we can all guess that he didn't want her parents interfering because he was living off of her. He was using her. When asked, Michelle admitted she had a hard time saying no to Fabian. For the rest of us, that means one thing. For Michelle, it's quite something else. Having a suggestible personality means you can be influenced easily, especially by those you trust. She loved and trusted Fabian. He got beneath her defenses, which to be honest, were lower than most. So when Fabian started talking about his cousin Jessica, who needed a place to stay, Michelle listened. Jessica Kelly, who was in prison for trafficking substances, was getting out of prison and needed a place to stay. Fabian told Michelle she would be homeless. Michelle didn't want that, so she agreed that Jessica could come stay with them, you know, for a week while she looked for a job. And I am certain Fabian didn't tell Michelle that while in prison, Jessica had a felony charge of conspiracy to commit rape added to her books in 2013. See, her and her cellmate chased another girl down, dragged her out from under her bunk where she was hiding to get away from them, and Jessica stood watch at the door while the cellmate essayed the girl with the mop. Yup, that's Jessica. You may have watched her testify at Fabian's trial, and she is easy to listen to. She seems just nice, right? On the stand, she wants you to believe she is a good person when she's not on substances. Was she on substances in prison when she stood guard and helped that girl be assaulted? So when Jessica gets out, she spends time with her family and sees her children, a young boy and a girl, and then she starts staying at Michelle's apartment. Michelle said that she seemed really nice, and she liked her from the beginning. Both Michelle and Jessica would testify that after Jessica went out and got substances, things changed. Jessica and Fabian, in the days leading up to Victoria's death, started doing meth. In fact, at 12.30 a.m. on August 23, 2016, Jessica and Fabian were wide awake doing substances. Michelle was asleep because she had to work the night shift. Michelle was the only one who did work in this house. When Michelle and Victoria woke up the, day, the next day, they made some cupcakes because it was Victoria's 10th birthday. The next day, Victoria had a half day of school, so they had planned to have a party in the park for Victoria. Victoria would never see the next day. So after they made cupcakes, Michelle took Victoria to the bus stop and watched her get on the bus. The rest of Michelle's day is something we th would think is kind of crazy. Basically, Michelle and Fabian drove around all day, stopping at his brother's house, his uncle's house. Each time he would go in and Michelle would wait in the car. This had become normal for Michelle. There was even a night when she wasn't working. Matthew was the son. Her, her eight-year-old son was with his dad. So she took Victoria with her, and they spent the whole night doing this, just driving around from place to place while Michelle and Victoria waited in the car. There has never been an explanation, but let me give you one. Fabian has admitted to smoking pot, and he also occasionally dabbled in the heavier stuff. 
One time during these rides, Michelle mentioned that he smelled like pot and that made him mad. Another time she told him he smelled like overcooked cotton candy. We're assuming that he smoked the meth stuff, but I don't know. So we're going out on a limb and saying that all of these rides were Fabian either doing or dealing. We don't know. I don't think it's a stretch at all to say that's what he's doing. And especially Michelle's just hanging out in the car. All these trips, she's just hanging out in the car. I do not have the patience for that. See, Michelle was, we are going to call her gullible. And she didn't ask and didn't seem to know what they were doing. I think most people would ask, what the, what are you doing? Why are you going? Why are we stopping all these places? Why can't I go inside? But for whatever reason, it became normal for them. And so this is just what they did. On that day, the 23rd, Michelle and Fabian were at their uncle's, at his uncle's house. Well, she was in the car and they weren't going to be able to make it back to the apartments in time to get Victoria off the bus. Michelle was trying to get Fabian to hurry up so they could leave. But remember, he's inside his uncle's house and she's, you know, in the car. In fact, we find out in court that Michelle had never met any of Fabian's brothers or uncles. So Michelle texts Jessica to ask her to get Victoria. Victoria off the bus because Jessica is at the apartment now. Uh, Jessica has been living there for about four days at this point. So she texted her, hey, can you get her off the bus? On the stand, Michelle said Jessica didn't respond to the text. So she ended up texting her mom. But then she told her mom not to come. That's because she didn't want her mom to know about both Fabian and Jessica. She didn't want her mom to be she just wanted her mom in the dark. Michelle says that when she called and spoke with Jessica, but at this point, Fabian comes out and drives home like a maniac. But on the stand, a neighbor testified that when she picked um, her child up from the bus stop, she saw Victoria alone. So she brought her back to her apartment and contacted Michelle to let her know that she had her daughter. Michelle told the neighbor it was okay just to let Vic Victoria go home that there was somebody at the house um, Jessica so that's exactly what she did Victoria heads back Jessica's there by the time Michelle and Fabian got home Victoria was already doing her homework on the porch when Jessica was on the stand she says she never con she was never contacted by Michelle to get Victoria off the bus she also stated at no point did anybody ask her to watch Victoria while Fabian and Michelle drove off again and again to do all these runs. Michelle on the stand says she said she absolutely did ask Jessica after Fabian talked her into it. Before I get into the timeline, what does Jessica say? She says she did substances all night before and all morning. She was highly paranoid that Fabian was going to stage an intervention or call the cops on her. So she was extremely paranoid. She thought that the TV was talking to her. At 6.05 p.m., Fabian and Victoria go to the gas station together. He gets a beer and she gets a Coke. At 6.15 they are back. Michelle and Fabian leave about 6.30. This is the last time Michelle will see Victoria. At 7.02 p.m., they return with cigarettes for Jessica, and then they leave again. These times are from precise GPS points from their cell phones in CCTV around the city. At 7.05, Victoria is seen alive outside by neighbors. Jessica says she sees Victoria outside alone and brings her into the apartment. She says she was not asked to watch her. She had no idea why she was even outside alone. Before we talk about Victoria, Michelle and Fabian were seen on CCTV and GPS around Albuquerque from 7.06 p.m. to 8.47 p.m. Jessica says during this time she was in the apartment with Victoria. She was paranoid, so she had the front door open a little so she could see if anybody was coming. She also had the balcony door open all day. She was going back and forth from the two doors, apparently all day long. 
She said around 7 p.m. Victoria was in her room. She had changed into her pajamas and was watching TV. She says that then a random man walked in to the apartment. Remember, the door is open a little bit, so he's able to just walk in. And this man asked for Fable, a nickname for Fabian. She said he wasn't there. He asked who was. She said just, you know, the little girl and gestured to Victoria's room. She says the man walked right into Victoria's room. Jessica said that the man seemed to belong there. He seemed to know the people that lived there. She had only been there for four days, so she doesn't know who was supposed to be there. You know, maybe it's a family member. When he went into Victoria's room, she went out on the porch to have a cigarette. What? This strange man walks in the house, walks into a 10-year-old's room that you don't know, and your best decision is to go smoke a cigarette outside? Who does that? She said when she came back and a few minutes later, the man exited Victoria's room and said, quote, Fabian fucked up and he knows he did. We have a mess in there to clean up. And if I don't get it done and let him know that it's going to be our lives and my kids' lives at sundown. That's, the, that's her story. She said when he left, she went in to check on Victoria and she was dead. She checked her pulse, and she was there was no sign of life. She wasn't disturbed. She looked like she was sleeping, she would say. The autopsy does confirm this in a way. Victoria's cause of death was strangulation. Right after her death, there were charges of SA and other things, but those were not supported by the autopsy or facts of evidence. When Jessica learned Michelle and Fabian returned in the car, the music was loud. She picked up Victoria's body, covered her in a blanket, and carried her outside to them. Why? Who, who knows? Well, she says she was still in a panic, worried the man would come back. It makes no sense. Either way, I it just nothing makes sense of this story. This is why it's so bizarre. She only made it down three steps, but Victoria was too heavy, so she had to carry her back inside, and she laid her down back in her bedroom. Neighbors that were outside at the time testified that they saw this. Jessica says as soon as Michelle and Fabian came in, she pulled Fabian aside and told him what happened. She testified that he looked at her like she was crazy and then went into Victoria's room to check. When he came back, he was freaking out too. Jessica's story is that for the rest of the night, Fabian's job was to keep Michelle distracted, first making tacos and then in the bedroom. Ew. Later that night, Jessica said she found Fabian dismembering Victoria. She didn't understand why he would do that when she thought they were just going to be dumping her up on the mesa why somebody else kills somebody so you go in and you decide to dismember them this story is all over the place it makes no sense because fabian actually wasn't there so he's not guilty but he's gonna dismember her what is wrong with people she says at this point he had cut off both of Victoria's arms and she then stopped him from going any further. She says he went to distract Michelle while she, Jessica, cleaned up the scene, the crime scene, her words. She put the arms in an orange clothes basket by the door and wrapped her body up in a sheet and blanket and put her in the bathtub until they could leave with the body. Then she lost it. She says she got so paranoid that they were going to get caught that she was already going to prison for one murder, Victoria's. So she decided at this point she needs to murder both Fabian and Michelle too. So she's innocent of killing Victoria, but the same night she's wanting to kill Fabian and Michelle. No, there was no reason. Just her crazy ideas. So she first went in 
and grabbed their cell phones. Then she picked up a clothes iron. And when Michelle came out of the bedroom, she hit her right in the face with this iron. She kept fighting with Michelle, but Fabian grabbed the iron and jumped off the balcony. Michelle says she ran for Victoria's room to save her, but she wasn't there. Jessica, at this point, was still following Michelle around the house, trying to attack her. Michelle was asking where her daughter was. When Michelle got to the front door, Jessica turned to her and said, Oh, by the way, your daughter is dead. Michelle was bleeding really bad from being hit with the iron, and she stumbled downstairs to where Fabian was. Fabian had gone downstairs to the neighbor's apartment, number 407, and asked them to call the police because he and Michelle were being attacked by Jessica. Now, my question is, if you are Fabian and you just spent the last few hours cutting up a little girl, would you be calling the police to that same apartment? I, I don't know. It's so weird. But that's exactly what he did. When the police arrived, they saw both Fabian and Michelle, who was bleeding really bad and ended up with 14 stitches in the head and face. When the officers arrived, Michelle was quick to let them know that her little girl, Victoria, was still in the apartment. She did not believe Jessica, uh, when she said that she was dead, she does not believe her, you know, just because out of her mind, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Just when the police officers pulled up to the parking lot of the apartments, the fire alarm goes off in Michelle's apartment, 808. When the officers approached the door, Jessica saw them, slammed the door in their faces, and locked the latch and chain while one set of officers broke down the front door, another set were around where the balcony was. The ones that were around on the balcony were just in time to see Jessica jump from the balcony. And she apparently didn't stick the landing very well because she would learn later that she broke her ankle. When asked what was going on, she tried to say she'd been pushed off the balcony and was running from bad guys. The police got her into the squad car. The officers then broke down the door. They searched the apartment for Victoria and this fire. Sadly, they found both in the back bathroom. In the bathtub, Victoria's already dead body was wrapped in a blanket and was on fire. They used another blanket and a towel to put the fire out. They double-checked for a pulse, but as the autopsy would later show, little Victoria had been dead for hours. On the stand, Jessica says that when she saw the police cars arrive in the parking lot, she panicked because they, had gotten rid of, they hadn't gotten rid of uh, Victoria's body yet. She went into the bathroom and lit the blanket in the sheet covering. Victoria was on fire. She took down and disabled two fire alarm uh, things in the apartment, and she was just about to leave when she saw the police at the door. She shut the door in their face and tried to flee. She says that's just natural for her. When she sees the police, she just naturally runs. Okay, I'm going to address the elephant in the room in this case. At the beginning of this case, after Victoria's body was found, all three adults were arrested. Then Michelle was interrogated, and she gave a confession. And it was a big one, and it screwed up this case for years to come. In the criminal complaint filed, Michelle said that Fabian and Jessica gave Victoria meth to calm her down so they could have intercourse with her. She said Fabian assaulted Victoria while Jessica put her hand over her mouth. Michelle said she was there and watched the whole thing. She said that then Fabian strangled Victoria. She said Jessica stabbed Victoria several times in the torso. Then Fabian and Jessica cut off Victoria's arms. Okay, mm -hmm. there it is. But here's the truth. That did not happen. First, the autopsy, Victoria did not have any illegal substances in her system. She had a small amount of alcohol, and there's no explanation for that, but she didn't have any substances. She also was not S8. She had been in the past, we know that, so the medical examiner found cause 
uh, for past abuse. But the APD didn't wait for the autopsy or the evidence to be processed. They didn't wait for the phones or the GPS or the CCTV to be processed. Instead, they took Michelle's statement and had a press conference. I guess what she is saying is hard to make up. So I get why they trusted her confession. But, oh, man, were they wrong? They told the world that this is what happened to Victoria. They were very, very, very wrong. After all the physical evidence was processed and the medical examiner found male DNA under Victoria's fingernails and on her neck, the DNA did not match Fabian. In fact, there's no match in the system whatsoever. They do have a warrant attached to the DNA. So if this man gets arrested and his DNA is entered into the system, this warrant will pop up. But until then, well, Michelle, who definitely wasn't there when Victoria died, pled guilty to one count of child abuse resulting in death. She hasn't been sentenced yet, but because she has no criminal history, most likely she'll get like a 12 to 15 years in prison. Jessica pled guilty to reckless child abuse resulting in death, tampering with evidence, and aggravated assault. Also in 2018, she was convicted of distribution of substances. She was sentenced to 44 years in prison where she took a plea. Without the plea, she was looking at, at about 200 years. Because of this kind of plea she got, basically she only has to serve half of that because of good behavior, so 22 years. Fabian did not take a plea deal. He pled not guilty. Now you should know that none of the three were charged with Victoria's murder. It's still basically unsolved. They were all charged with the setting, the circumstances, so that she that it could happen, but not the actual action itself. Fabian was just found guilty of reckless child abuse resulting in death and several counts of tampering with evidence. Apparently, the jury believed Jessica's story. What really happened to Victoria? I don't think we'll ever know. Was there a stranger that came into the apartment and strangled her with no screams or cries for help? And then he just walked back out like Jessica Kelly says? Or did Jessica Kelly kill her? Those are our choices. <laughs> they have proof through technology, the GPS on, and their phones, and eyewitness testimony that Fabian and Michelle were not home at the time Victoria died. Her time of death is accurately set by the medical examiner. And in the autopsy, it read between 7.45 and 8.30. This is a extremely narrow window in which Fabian and Michelle weren't at the house then. They were busy getting drugs. They had been all day. They did not come into the trial at all though. Honestly, if it had been Michelle's trial, then it would have been brought up, but it was Fabian's trial and it may be the only trial Victoria ever gets. So what do you believe? Joe and Pat Martins, Victoria's grandparents, filed a lawsuit against Albuquerque Police Department and several of, of its officers after her death. Their issue, as outlined, was that child services did exactly what they were supposed to by calling the police department, but the police department did not. Under New Mexico's Children's Code of Law Enforcement, an officer is trained in the investigation of child abuse and in Glock must investigate reports of alleged child abuse. They were supposed to follow up on the five calls Michelle made and generated referrals to them. As shown in the lawsuit, not only did this not happen, there were no oversight or direct reportings to see if, if anything. They did nothing. I've read the lawsuit and it, there's no monetary value set to it. Uh, the main goal is a structured system of checks and balances for investigating reports of abuse. It does not require a lot of extra money. It just requires training for the APD to do the right thing. Also, the lawsuit did not have a monetary value, as I 
mentioned, the lawsuit was filed early in the case when the false confession was still in place, but that had been dismissed. According to their lawyer, they may file again. They are waiting to see if APD makes the changes on their own. Isn't this a crazy case? And I hate that we don't know. It is completely possible that a strange man walked into the apartment. I, I, you know, stranger things have happened. But I'm almost, she was freaking out. I think she just thought that Victoria, Jessica was freaking out that she thought Victoria was in some way going to hurt her. So she went after her. The fact that she tried to kill um, Michelle and Fabian, I don't know. It's so weird. You guys let me know your thoughts. Oh, let's leave a purple heart in the comments for Victoria and her surviving brother. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like to become a channel member or a Patreon, you can do so by clicking the link in the description box. Well, if you have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Cases playlist if you would like to check them out. Either way, stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. Bye.